Like our brain is trying all the time to control itself. To be in love is to let someone else control your own brain and have access to things that you don't have access in your own mind. We don't know fully who we are, so neuroscience will give you a complementary answer to things that people cannot tell you about themselves. The world of marketing is interested in creating bubbles and knowing who's in the bubble and controlling them. This is what genius is, to be able to get into many people's minds despite their age, gender, race, interest, and so on, and make them all alike. Uh, we call those functions the survival things, the four Fs. Feeding, fearing, fighting, and mating. Those are the four things that we all do to survive. Mate, mating mating's that, an M. That's not an F, but I think I know what yeah. you meant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for businesses. If you have ever wanted to grow your business faster than what you can right now, if you need to make more revenue, if you need more leads, if you need more clients, if you need to know how to plan your business in a strategic way in order to hit big goals, if you need to learn how to scale your business and grow your team and your business so that you have more freedom, then this program is for you. Imagine three days immersed with me where we cover all aspects of business, but we do it from an immersive, but also an execution standpoint. We execute every step of the way and we're looking at five key areas we're looking at your psychology we're looking at your marketing your sales your leadership and we're looking at your planning and how we integrate these five key areas to grow your business and your brand quickly so if you'd like to find out more information kerwinray.com ladies and gentlemen it's my absolute pleasure to welcome to unstoppable today dr moran surf moran great to have you here mate Thank you. Good to see you. Mate, great to see you again. And last time we spoke, you were in, uh, in the Windy City in Chicago, uh, and you've now, uh, you've now found yourself over in New York. Yeah, I am. And still unstable. <laughs> Everything is still <laughs> and you, you getting were, there. You were saying before, it's like a, an open ghost town. It's a little, bit, uh, a little bit eerie, yeah? Very strange, yeah. Yeah, no, no gyms are open and everyone's exercising on the street. So, mate... Um, Look, I know that we've had the pleasure, you spoke at one of our K2 Elite events recently, uh, so I feel like I've got a bit of an unfair advantage here over the audience. I know a little bit more about you, but let's say you're at a dinner party with seven people that you've never met before. They're all high-level people or from a range of different walks of life, and um, the, 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 the conversation goes quiet. It turns to you, Moran, someone says to you, so, mate, what do you do? How do you answer that question? So I'm a professor of neuroscience and business, uh, I teach neuroscientists how their brain works, and I teach businesses, MBA students, and uh, people that are actually applications uh, of the neuroscience users. Yeah, right. And so neuroscience in a commercial application, this is something that's been, been becoming increasingly more popular because I remember when I first got into uh, into marketing in the in the mid '90s, you know, there was a lot of talk around the importance of understanding psychology when it came to marketing and how you know the basis of all forms of marketing and leadership and persuasion and you know influence at a brand level is all about understanding the psychology. But um, what has neuroscience been able to give us that psychology couldn't from a from a business perspective, from a leadership or a, or a marketing perspective? That's a great question. So I think that the simplest answer is that it can give you the kernel of understanding of psychology. So if you could look at someone's behavior and say, okay, now I understand their psychology, understand how they operate. Now you can actually go one level deeper and say, what is it in their brain that makes them behave this way? And in doing that, what can I change to make them behave differently? So not just like this is given, this is how this person is working and it's just what it is. Can I do something that will make them behave differently? And so what is, like, because one of the things that you said you do is you, you teach people how the brain works. And so I guess from a marketing perspective, I'm, I'm curious to know, and I'm sure everyone else is curious to know, how, or even a sales perspective or just the perspective of being more influential, how does the brain work? So if I were to uh, simplify it into one sentence, I would say that the brain's sole purpose is to understand the current state of the world and predict the next one so you can make sense of the environment. So the brain is trying to take what it can get from the world around us and predict what's going to happen next and decide how to operate. That's what the brain is doing. In a more philosophical way, the brain is the only thing that Mother Nature gave us 
that can uh, respond to changes in the world after we're born. So our DNA is coding everything about us once we're born, where our height, the color of our eyes, how our immune system is going to work is all written in a code that we want to be able to change. The only change will happen in the next generation. So Mother Nature gave us one organ in the body that still changes after we're born and responds to the environment. So if it gets too warm in the world after you're born, your DNA won't change. So you better find a way to wear different clothes after you're born. Otherwise, you will actually melt. So I think that the point is that the brain is the tool that nature gave us to respond to the environment. In the context of business, it means that it's the tool that codes our decisions, our emotions, mm. our uh, uh, ecstasy and agony. So if we understand that, we can understand our customers better, we can understand ourselves better and manage people better, we can make decisions better, we can actually get to the core of who we actually are. So what have you learned from neuroscience from the perspective of this is where most people go wrong when it comes because again, and I'm 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 probably going to gear this in a different direction to a normal episode. You know, normally we look at people's little bit of people's history and their story, and we'll look at that as well. But I, I really want to take the opportunity because you know I'm sitting down with a neuroscientist. And I fucking love neuroscience, neuroanatomy, neurobiology, neurochemistry, but I love understanding it from the perspective of how the brain works. Exactly like you talk about, mm -hmm. the brain receives information. It processes that information based on you know a whole range of factors. And that determines, in some cases, what we could, could be considered what could be a predictable response. Now, for most people, they go, well, one of the things that I've learned when it comes to marketing my business is pr people predictably don't respond to it. And so what do you think are some of the mistakes that you've learned or that you've observed that people make from a branding perspective, from a social perspective, you know, from an influence perspective when it comes to trying to influence people, but their message or their, or their movements fall, fall short? I'll give you two. One that people often make, myself included, is that we're quick to make stories out of a few data points. Meaning we play basketball with the blue underwear and we win. We play basketball a second time with the blue underwear and we win. We immediately say, okay, the blue underwear is the one to wear because it leads to my winning the basketball game. Our brain really loves finding signal in patterns. So we, it takes two data points and makes meaning out of them. It's probably not true. But we can't, we can't avoid it. This is our brain's nature. It takes little data and tries to make it into a story. And I think that if we can break this habit of immediately finding meaning where there isn't, we can help ourselves actually seek meaning in more structured data. That's one mistake. The other one that we make often is that we actually listen to people's answers rather than look at their brains when it comes to explaining this meaning. So most marketing managers, if they want to know something, they ask the customer via surveys, focus groups, and so on. And it's not that this is totally flawed, but it's not complete. People will give you answers if you ask them for an answer, but they don't know themselves. We don't know fully who we are, so neuroscience will give you a complementary answer to things that people cannot tell you about themselves. And you said something interesting. People will take a few data points and they'll make a big story out of it. And one of the things that I've learned, and this is going to probably sound incredibly basic to you, but I remember uh, someone teaching me this maybe about 10 or 12 years ago. They said, well, Kerwin, one of the things you've got to understand when it comes to marketing or persuasion in general, that there's three brains. You know, you've got the reptilian brain, you've got the mammalian brain, and then you've got the neocortex. And they said, look, all the incoming information comes through to the reptilian brain first. And depending on how that reptilian brain responds will determine as to whether that information will get passed up the chain to you know, the mammalian and then the decision-making cortex or whether that information gets passed through to the amygdala and a neurotoxin is attached to it and they now consider you a threat. And I was like, so how do you get through? And it's like, well, one of the most important things you've got to understand, this is what he said to me, is the reptilian brain is really basic. And this is where I heard you say it, it takes a couple of very small data points and it creates a big picture. So is it fair to say that in some respects, that one of the reasons that people fail when it comes to messaging or when it comes to marketing is they try to use too many data points. They're trying to use too much information. And as a result, the, the brain can't create its own story and it becomes overwhelmed. So I think, first of all, I, I don't know if you want, I, I wrote a note to myself to make sure that your audience knows what reptilian brain is, what a, a neocortex Tell are. people so what that is. Yeah, what is, so what I is that? Make a, yeah. made a note to, to explain that in case no one knows it. But basically, if we try to explain kind of neuroscience 101, the basics, the easiest way to think about it is to take your two fists, put them together, and assume that this is the brain. This is roughly the size of the brain. It's much smaller than the skull. And if you look at uh, a hand that's kind of made into a fist, the lower part connected to the 
arm is what we think of the uh, spinal cord connected to the brain, and the lower part is the reptilian brain. That's a part of the brain that's in charge of basic functions that keep you alive, and it's shared among most animals. Uh, we call those functions the survival things, the four Fs, the thing that kind of help you, you know, really uh, not die. Breathing, feeling hungry, fall asleep. We, the four Fs are uh, feeding, fearing, fighting, and mating. Those are the four things that we all do to survive. Mate, mating mating is an M. That's not an F, but I think I know what you yeah. meant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Finding mates. <laughs> Finding <laughs> mates. Yeah, there we go. That's, That's the last one. <laughs> so then the, you have the thumb kind of under the fingers in this uh, model of the fist. That's the uh, part of the brain, the limbic system, the part of the brain that is in charge of emotions and in charge of memories. It's basically things that we can access but not control. So our emotions are accessible to us. We know that we're feeling sad or happy, but it's not like we're turning it on and off on on our own kind of will. It's not like I'm saying, hey, my girlfriend is sick, time to feel sad, tick, turn sadness on for 10 minutes, okay, enough, turn it off. It happens to us. We have access to it, we can impact that, but we don't really control it fully. It's somehow in between not under our control to fully under our control. And the top layer, the fingers that co that cover that, that's the cortex, that's the surface of the brain, that's the new part. It's about 100,000 years old. It's, kind of, it's only uh, available to some uh, advanced animals like uh, apes and monkeys and humans and, and other advanced uh, animals. This is the part that allows us to actually control things, predict the future, think thoughts that are not real and actually uh, simulate them in their mind. This is why, for example, humans are able to invent things that they don't exist, but they can still talk about them. We can talk about democracy. Even the democracy doesn't really exist. Like it's not like something you can wear or eat. It's an idea in people's mind, but we all understand what it is. We can talk about unicorns that no one's seen, but we created this imagery and we share it among brains and we use this part of the brain that is magically able to stimulate non-existent worlds to share ideas. And this is the thing that gives humans their power, this thing. So now we kind of covered the basic of the brain. I think that the top part, the neocortex, is responsible for our ability to imagine things that are not there. You don't have to uh, taste every type of ice cream out there uh, to know that some of them are bad. You can just imagine how an ice cream that's made out of the throw up of my puppy would taste and you don't even make it, you just don't, don't tr go there. It's because our brain is able to simulate a future that doesn't exist and cancel it or immediately kind of disqualify it from being good right away. That's a feature of the human brain that is remarkable. Uh, and it also comes uh, handy when we try to make stories of our own existence. We can say, the meaning of all of my life is this and that. Uh, where I'm heading is there, but not there. We can actually say, if I do those five things, I'm going to feel happier or not. However, this is not perfect. And we make mistakes. And sometimes we create a trajectory that says, if I do A, B, C, this is going to happen. And then it doesn't happen. And now, who's at fault? Is it that we didn't make the right predictions? Is it that things changed on the way? What we need to learn, and that's the key to business owners, is how to understand what is the mental model people have for their future and how you can help them either get there or change it if they're inaccurate. And that is hard because we have to access the brain. It's not that people, people tell us. People don't know how to articulate those things, but in their brain lie this trajectory that they made for themselves and we can access it and help them either realize that or change it. And so how do you communicate to someone <clears throat> in a way that will help them take the perspective that you can help them achieve that future outcome when you're doing it in a mass market perspective, as an example, like uh, uh, you're, you're going out with a campaign, you're not going to be able to find out the model of the world for every person that you're going to be marketing to, and you have to create some assumptions. How do you create those assumptions in a meaningful way that enables your message to be able to penetrate and be received in a way that makes creates that level of alignment that triggers the behavior that we're after. So we've been studying engagement, basically how to affect a lot of brains simultaneously in a similar way for a while. And we found some basic things that work, but I would say that even better than applying those things is to actually know more about the target audience that you care about and make something specific to them. So I'll give you the general things that are, work for everyone, but Keep in mind, you and your audience, that even better than what I'm saying right now is to do know something about your audience and perfect it for these people at the expense of like everyone. For example, uh, we know that uh, uh, 
messages that uh, are simpler, short sentences that have only one idea in them usually resonate with the brains more than longer ones across the board. Not surprising, but but it's important to know that we know that just stories. Just out of curiosity, is and is that is that something that's decreasing over time? Because what, one of the things we're discovering is attention spans are decreasing. You know, yeah. it is decreasing over time. Younger people are even a shorter attention span requiring requiring. It's even not just the the length of the words. It becomes even a top, an issue of like uh, things on a screen. So if you're making a trailer for a movie. The fewer characters you show on the screen at a given time, the better. Mm -hmm. So people now are less able to tolerate five people on the screen. Even if one of them speaks at a time, we prefer to see the camera on one, the other, one, the other, rather than seeing two people talking. So right now what we're doing, we have two of us on the screen. It's for young people would be even more complicated than just seeing you for a second, me for a second, you for a second. So it's not even words. It's just ideas or concepts. So that's kind of one thing. Another thing we learned is, I mean, that's also not true, not new, but but definitely true, is that stories resonate well. Mm. Uh, I think that it was uh, either uh, attributed to Mother Teresa or to Stalin that uh, one uh, person's uh, suffering is horrible, but one million is statistics. Uh, that is kind of how our brain works. If you tell people that uh, something terrible happened in Beirut a week ago, they kind of lump together the tragedy of thousands of people into one kind of anecdote. But if you show them one kid that was injured, suddenly this kid has a lot more resonance with our brain than the number 1,000 people injured. So the brain likes stories with a character, with a identifiable victim, with something that we can uh, resonate with. Uh, one thing that we learned that's not uh, trivial, that is less kind of obvious to everyone who's thought about like messaging, is the importance of uh, breaks. So if you and I talk right now, for let's say 30 minutes. And uh, I would try to be engaging consistently. Like I would always be high energy, high power. Every sentence would be, uh, you know, kind of low, uh, very kind of impactful and so on. I would actually lose some people. Like there's no way to keep the brain at high engagement the entire time. People need a break. So the good speakers or the good communicators are actually able to give the audience a break that's co controlled for. Like they decide that they're going to take a break here, let everyone take a breather, and then carry them over. So good rhetoricians, like speak speakers, like Martin Luther King, Barack Obama, and so on, what they do in their speeches, if you look at that, at some point they will say things like, and the next idea I think is relevant only for those of you who are billionaires. And he says something that most of the audience doesn't care about. So he basically tells the audience, right now is your time to take a break. I'm going to talk to the three people who actually care about that. And then he says, okay, enough with the billionaires. Let's go back to everyone. And he carries you back. And then he says, and the next idea I'm going to talk about is capitalism is doing this and that to you. So he actually kind of controls the, the uh, mental breathing. He tells people, you can leave me right now. You can go back. When I give talks to audiences, I say, in the next slide, I'm going to talk about the mathematics of that. If you don't care about that, that's the time to doze off. I'm going to tell you when you have to come back. And in doing that, I tell everyone in the audience when they can take a mental uh, sigh and come back with me. And this way, I know that when I want to be engaged, they are engaged. A lot of people think that, okay, they should be all the time funny. That's not going to work. You have to actually control the breaks. And I guess if I were to give one more kind of big idea is that uh, generally people like closures. So if you open an idea and you leave it open and you kind of go and attention to something else, people don't remember that there was, an, that there was a branch, but they feel uncomfortable. Something in their brain remains at like a level that's not perfect because their mind keeps saying, I, I have an open thread there that's not complete. So either finish every thought that you started. If you say, I have four points, one, two, three, here's my fourth, I'm done. Or don't say, I have four points. But if you, if you start something, finish it, or say, I'm not going to finish it, but don't let the audience wander off with the thought that something is incomplete without you uh, controlling it. I know in psychology, we call that opening and closing loops. Um, but I'm curious to know if that is a strategy that you've discovered is actually a great way to actually increase engagement where you perhaps open a loop, you go off on a tangent, you share a story, okay? But then you literally have these people going, well, but what happened back here? And then, then you close out the loop once you finish the unrelated story to keep people you know, essentially engaged and, and entertained. 
if you can, it works beautifully. If you can, if you, if you build a talk or, or an ad and you remember all the puzzles that were open and you close them, the audience is impressed. Like people, when the resolution happens, people actually like you. It's just the worst thing to forget that. So if you say, I'm going to remember, I, I build my entire plan for the next 30 minutes with four ideas. I'm going to tell you that there are going to be four ideas and I'm going to start with idea number one and then a story and then it reminds me of association and then idea number two and, and at the end I'm saying, okay, these are my four ideas. I can summarize them for you. You get all of that. People would love you. But if you forget one of them, if you don't resolve an open thing, people will, don't, they wouldn't know to articulate it. Like, they, like that's the power of neuroscience. They won't be able to tell you I'm upset because this happened, but somehow if you look at their brain, you will see that there's a failure to get 100% engagement because somewhere in their brain, there's a thread running and saying, like, I didn't get the reward I'm expecting. Mm. So how can we take these apl applications to perhaps a social environment? You know, we've only got in some cases, let's call it, because um, most people have what we re what I refer to as the Snapchat attention span. You know, most people, and it's not even that. Like, and again, you might be able to tell me this because I remember, oh, oh gosh, the latest information was the, the average attention span is about four to six seconds. Is that right? I think that they, it comes from a study on, of Hollywood films. Right. So Hollywood used to have long shots where it was like you know thirty seconds, and the camera was follow would follow the character and like into the room. And now, if you look at the Hollywood film, it's averaging about five seconds cut. So every five seconds, there's like a, there's like thousands of more cuts in a one and a half hours movie compared yeah. to Charlie Chaplin the movies like you know seventy, eighty, uh, and and I, I think the thing that's most disturbing is I think Goldfish actually have a seven second attention span. Yeah. That's they're, they're, kind of scary. they're getting better. But it plays into what you're saying, the importance of having breaks. But I guess my question would be, you know, is there room for us to consider things like micro breaks? Because, you know, perhaps if someone's giving like a 30-minute, 45-minute keynote presentation, there might be the requirement for people to, you know, create a, a long and engaged or a long and disengaged pause for people to, you know, recalibrate and rehabilitate their attention span to re-engage. But let's say you're, you're in a conversation or you're in a, a messaging frame where you've only got maybe 30 seconds to three minutes. Does a pregnant pause or a micro break that's uninspected, does that have the same impacts and effects? Uh, so the, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a you know, magic thing to know how to pause for the right amount of time. And the medium makes a big difference. If you're on TV, on CNN, you're given 10 seconds for every sentence at the most before you get cut. So, you know, one second out of 10 becomes critical. If you are giving instead of the union address uh, to, you know, the Congress in the US where you have an hour, then breaks of 10 seconds would work for you. I think you need to know somewhat the audience and the, and the marker. I, I would say that uh, people normally don't take breaks enough. So longer, the better. When I'm giving uh, talks that are very public, uh, in kind of large uh, rooms, uh, I mechanically tell myself to take breaks and look someone in the eye and go back. To me, it feels like time standing still. Like, what is going on? It's been so long. When I look at the video, I never even can tell when was this moment where I took a break. One time I was asked to give a talk and I was given advice by an expert speaker. And he said, you might forget your words at some point, you might forget what you're going to say. When you forget, don't say, I forgot. This will kind of tell everyone that you forgot. Just take a pause, try to remember and continue. Most times, people would think that you're just thinking and that this was actually an intentional pause. And when I actually did it once, took the pause to remember and calibrate and continue, that was when I was told by everyone, this was the most powerful message that you gave us. Because people think that, okay, you really thought about it. And said, I think as an advice, I would say longer pauses than you think you need. Yeah, right. It, it, Calibrate for that. And and, it, and it's a powerful way to engage people because in some respects, especially if they're engaged to what you're saying and you stop, mm -hmm. it engages the the intrigue, the novelty, which is in most cases, you know, what most so many advertisers, so many marketing and the you know, the 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 the, the chemical profile of, of intrigue, I believe, is norepinephrine and dopamine. And that's where we're essentially presented with you know, a novel concept or something that's new or something that's exciting. I think in the movies, they call it the cliffhanger where all of a sudden there's a scene that happens. We don't know what happens next. You know, I think one of the most favorite, famous Holly, Hollywood um, horror films, it was Jaws. And, you know, there was an, I think it was an hour and 47 minute film. And for an hour and 44 minutes, you never even saw the fucking shark. Yet yeah. people were traumatized to the point where they were actually walking out of, um, of, 
of of the cinemas because they were so scared. So how do we engage novelty? How do we engage intrigue in a way that is actually effective and doesn't actually make people go, well, well hang on, I'm not actually really interested in what happens next. It's, it's, it's mm-hmm. more just uncomfortable silence now. So, uh, so it is an art. And I should say uh, that, that some of it is really a talent that some people have naturally. And even if you tie your best, you will never beat those people that are just born with that. So some people, they just have the right voice, the right cadence, and they do it. And we can do a good job in getting closer, but there are some people that are just talented in that. And that is also something that we should kind of remind people, that that it is a skill that you uh, can be born with. I think that the best way to learn that, in my mind, there are two. One is to watch a lot of good speakers and you choose who's good in your mind, but you, you, you start keeping a diary and you say, okay, this one is a good speaker. This one is a good marketer. This one is a good communicator. Make a note, watch more and more of them and uh, you will kind of by osmosis learn that without making those notes and say, okay, I should take a pause for two seconds on. You will start seeing how they do it and you will get it. The other tip that I would say is really, really important, but is uh, try to tell jokes. So jokes is one of the uh, amazing skill uh, that is really, really hard because to tell a joke that's funny, you have to put yourself in the mind of the other person. The other person could be different people. It could be a kid, an adult, and you have to really understand how they see the world and create a, some, a mechanism that will break uh, some expectations in their mind, control the timing perfectly, control the cadence, control the pitch. It's really hard to tell good jokes. Comedians are... Uh, trying again and again and practicing and they go to you know small clubs and they try the material on different people before they kind of put their one hour special show telling jokes is a very uh, easy way to train yourself to understand other people and to see how to communicate in a short three minutes idea that uh, kind of is resonating with the audience so that's a very practical way that you can try. I know when um, when social media, well, social media has been big for a while, but I know when I first started getting into it quite heavily was in about 2015, 2016, Snapchat was new to the market <clears throat> and it was blowing up all over the place. And, you know, it was all about having these 10 second stories that, um, you know, enabled you to, you know, communicate in, in, in these small little sound bites. And I remember when I first got on Snapchat, <clears throat> completely oblivious to the culture of the platform, um, I would get on every morning and I'd do like, you know, 15 or 16 Snapchats in a row, you know, just talking about a concept for, you know, and then shooting it and keep going and keep, you know, and then 16 Snapchats later, you know, I'd produce, let's call it a minute and a half, two minutes of content. And then after my first couple of weeks on Snapchat, I, I remember going back to all the content and going, fuck, why are, why are people only watching the first couple of videos? They're not, they're not really watching past the first three videos and there's a massive decline. And it was at that point I realized I was like, oh, fuck. People actually don't go to Snapchat to watch a two and a half minute video. They go to Snapchat to watch out at that t- at that time. It was a 10 second video. And then I remember thinking to myself going, well, how the fuck do I say something interesting in 10 seconds? And that, that in itself became the challenge. And it was like, right, how do we communicate something really interesting within a 10 second framework to be able to engage them enough to want to go through to that, you know, that next story? And uh, I remember when I went from doing 16 snaps at a time to doing one snap you know, every hour, every hour and a half, my consumption went through the roof uh, because I was trying to communicate really effectively, but I was also opening loops that I wasn't closing and that people had to come back an hour or an hour and a half in order to be able to close. And it had a massive impact. But I guess when you then, um, you know, you zoom out from the Snapchat perspective, maybe into the YouTube perspective or the Facebook or the Instagram perspective, which is a little bit more like the Snapchat perspective, how do we organize our communication in a way where we maximize the potential for engagement ongoing, not just necessarily in that moment? So you, you, you remind me of so many things. I, ha- I constantly have to remind myself, like, what are the things that I have to say and what's the question that you asked that I have to uh, uh, put my thoughts into? Um, so here's the thing. Generally... Because the brain is all about solving puzzles Mm. and and kind of finding meaning and so on, puzzles work. Uh, If you can uh, create a thought 
that leaves a question at the end that is interesting enough that someone wants to resolve, you can carry them for a few more steps with you. Uh, that's kind of one, one way. It's hard to do that. So uh, putting a puzzle in short time that uh, I'm calling it puzzle, but it would be like a question is a tough thing. But if you can do that, and some people are able to do that, and I'll give you one tip to how it's uh, often pop working for people, then this is one way. Another thing I, I wanted to say is that uh, people go to different medium with an expectation. So Snapchat, you're right, 10 seconds is what's expected. When people turn a uh, YouTube and they see an ad, they expect the ad to deliver a message in five seconds because after five seconds, the skip ad appears. So they give you five seconds and you have to convince them to stay the six. Uh, when people listen to a politician speak, they actually are okay with a few minutes. I think it's usually five minutes if it's a speech, not like on TV. Five minutes before an idea comes up. So they let politicians, they give them kind of a grace period of three minutes to just start and build an idea before they do it. Uh, when you watch a company CEO presenting the new product, think of uh, Steve Jobs presenting the new iPhone, uh, you know, one of those kind of uh, events, people are actually okay uh, even with uh, up to nine minutes of a uh, you talking without us knowing where it's going. So each medium has its own kind of time. And, and every person from your audience who is interested in communicating an idea also should think, what is the medium I'm, I'm using for that? If you're the same message trying to send in Snapchat, YouTube, an ad on TV or via speech, you will get different uh, times. And I, and I promised an answer, and I'm going to close the loop as before. I promised a specific way that actually uh, works across the board uh, multiple times in giving people a suspenseful moment that they are uh, going to stay with, and that is uh, rhetoric questions. Turns out that uh, if you're giving a speech, but you ask a rhetoric question, and you take a pause after that, many people in the audience are actually answering it in their mind. And then when you answer it, the first thing they do is either if they said the same thing you say, they tap on the shoulder and say, oh, I knew it. Like I, I thought the same thing that he or she are saying. They're happy. If not, they are even more engaged because now you kind of violated their expectations. So they now want to know the answer. And either way, they spend time answering your question in their mind. It's very in, So if you look at engagement, after a rhetoric question, there's usually a spike in engagement. Everyone in their mind is answering it. So a lot of uh, politicians do that often. They basically give a speech. There's no interaction. It's, it's them on the podium talking to the audience. But they say, what kind of world do you want? A world where this happens or a world where that happens? And they take a pause of 10 seconds. And everyone thinks, I want this world. And they say, well, I'm offering you that world. And this thing is a moment of peak engagement. It's not suspenseful in the sense, it's not like a detective story where you kind of say, OK, is it the butler or not? People are not suspenseful in, because they say, okay, I want to know the answer, but you actually got them to pause for a second and do something that everyone else is doing in their mind at the same time. And this shared experience is working and keeping people engaged for a few more seconds. So I've, I, um, I've been taking a lot of notes or little, little bullet points whilst you've been going through to try and, I guess, construct the ultimate formula for delivering a, a message that's going to get through. And here's what I've got so far. And so from what I've heard you say, one of the most important things when it comes to delivering a strong message that's going to get through is it, it needs to start with being simple because the more simple it is, the more easily that that brain, that reptilian brain is going to be able to absorb it. But it's also important from what you've said to be able to ask questions or open loops that creates a level of curiosity whereby you start to feed that curiosity with stories that are interesting and perhaps entertaining that leads them to a question or a puzzle that they're unsure how to solve that is ultimately closed by closing out the loop and the question that was originally asked. That's perfect. Let me add two more. <sighs> oh, please. I was, this is what I was waiting for. What's missing? <laughs> uh, one I would add is uh, control your voice. That is also really powerful. If you're in theater, uh, they spend a lot of time on just oh, deciding tonality. yeah, when... I would raise my voice or lower it. This is kind of advanced. And but that's, cri that's actually critical because as a speaker, I can, I can say for a fact, the more monotone you are, the more people, even if the content's really interesting and really thought provoking, they'll drain out. And it's almost like it needs that level of inflection, that, that vocal variety 
so because it's unexpected i'm assuming is that is that what it is that engages people yes it is it's it's basically showing them that uh, there is something that they don't know that's coming they did not know this is coming it tells them exactly mm-hmm. when they should care when they should not it's it's a uh, making them kind of wake up if if they're kind of dr- losing you because you kind of increase the volume and so on it, it controls a lot of variables that people are not uh, using on day-to-day experience most times when people talk they just keep the same voice by doing that you kind of express that this is a different talk than just a conversational uh, you know one one to one regular chat it's different a side note to that would be that if you're presenting visually the body is also a tool that you have mm-hmm. the decision whether you move or not whether you look someone in the eyes or not whether you use your hands or not all of those are decisions that that it's not that there's a correct or incorrect one but it has to be decided upon if you decide to move why is it because you want to kind of say that this spot on the stage is where i talk about the bad things and i'm moving to this spot and I'm talking about the good things and people in their mind associate that i'm here talking about good things and i'm going here to tell them what's bad and back again do you create this thing or not do you uh, uh, with your hands actually create like if you say there's three things and you create a kind of hierarchy that this is the top one, this is the bottom one. I can say three things. So all of those things are decisions to make. They're not, they shouldn't be arbitrary. That, those are all in one. And I give you another one that's uh, really common and, and important in the world of business. Uh, people many times in the world of business give the customer, the audience numbers, but the audience or the customer doesn't know what to make of those numbers. I'll give you a clear example. If I say... Uh, using this uh, drug makes people uh, decrease their uh, smoking by 90%. You don't know yet if it's a lot or little. And if I say, which is a lot, now you know. So me just saying this drug makes people drop their uh, desire to smoke by 90%. And if I say, which is very little, so for the same numbers, I now gave you what I want you to take. So a lot of times people give you the numbers without helping you interpret that. And then people would pick up later what it meant, but without the interpretation, many times people just kind of keep afloat the the number and they don't yet know. If I say there's an increase in number of cuts in a movie uh, in the last couple of years to 1,000 cuts. Okay. Which is a lot compared to movies in the 1930s, which only had 20 cuts. Now you know, okay, people cut movies more. So, so I think that it's important to not stay with just the number, but also give people as easy as possible interpretation, digest it for them. Mm. Like you don't want to have a person stuck calculating things when you kind of move on in a talk. You want to make it easy for your audience. So I think we've really got an incredible process when it comes to understanding how to construct a message, um, whether that be a you know a ten second message to a three minute or a thirty minute or even an hour and a half film, in many respects. But I guess the biggest question that a lot of people ask is, well, how do I capture the attention? Considering there's so much competition for attention span, and I know you know back in 1992, I think there was a study that I read that on average the the, the average consumer received 3,000 commercial messages a day. Now you might have the latest update from that, but I remember seeing another research paper somewhere saying that it was in the vicinity of 23,000 plus or 18 to 23,000 plus commercial messages that people, is that, is that about, what, what are your numbers on the commercial yeah. messages? It's, so people see between 10,000 to 40,000 brands a day. And, 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 but, but, and you know, here a brand would be, you see a t-shirt that says, a, yeah. I don't know, Quicksilver on it, it counts. That's a commercial you see message. a BMW. So, so you see yeah. a lot of things and not all of them actually, you know, resonate with us. Like everything that we see pretty much can be seen as a brand. Not everything really stays with us. But if you're a brand, and you count that, then you get to those remarkable high numbers. So how do you cut through to be able to grab that attention and dominate that attention span for that three seconds that's required in order to engage them in the narrative that you're about to take them on? So that's a, t- a tough one. So here, I'm not sure I'm going I'm I'm to know the, the uh, ultimate answer to how do you do it that, in a way that no one else does. I can tell you uh, one way that you don't want to do which is uh, doing bad things definitely does it. So if you, so, the example I often give when I speak about engagement uh, as a way to kind of explain what it is and explain that it's not always good 
is that of a traffic jam because of an accident. So if you drive on a two-way uh, lane and there's an accident on the other one, you are very likely to have a traffic jam on your lane. Like, why should there be a traffic jam on the other lane, the other direction? Because everyone who drives by wants to look and see it. And you're annoyed when you're waiting 10 minutes to get to the next kilometer. And you tell yourself, okay, when I get there, I won't look. And you just can't do that. You can't not look. You've got to do it somehow. So no one wants to be in the place of the, you know, person in the accident, but it's just engaging and we can't look away. So in that sense, engagement is easy if you appeal to the reptilian, mammalian, limbic system, if you if you make people, you know, activate the things that they're all afraid of. But it, it's not a necessarily a good thing. You, you want to not just make people engage, you want them to also have positive outlook. And here, I think that uh, besides applying kind of all the tools that we said before, I would say that this requires being a genius. So in my mind, and I'm going to go on a really philosophical tangent for a few seconds now, I promise it's going to be short. Uh, what makes Picasso a genius, what makes Mozart a genius, what makes Hitchcock and Spielberg geniuses is that they were able to make content that everyone wants to consume. And in a way, their genius is the ability to sit in their editing room, in their studio, uh, in the you know little uh, chamber that uh, uh, they have, and tap into everyone's mind. When Picasso, you know, used a brush to kind of draw something on a canvas, he was able miraculously to tape into the minds of people in New Zealand, Australia, uh, in uh, Africa, people who have never seen him that lived. Century, uh, decades after he died that are born right now and all somehow find his paintings interesting enough to stay a few more seconds and investigate them. This is what genius is, to be able to get into many people's minds despite their age, gender, race, interest, and so on, and make them all alike. And this is why we deem Picasso, Mozart, Spielberg geniuses, because they have this talent that they can sit in their studio Imagine everyone else's mind and do the right brush or the right note in the concert that everyone would think should be there. One of the things I saw, a, um, I've seen this actually, I, I keep my eye on this all the time. I'm always looking at um, the data that comes through on Netflix thumbnails because there's always people putting together information and data on, you know, what the most popular Netflix thumbnails are and then they'll deconstruct it. And I remember reading, oh, this is probably about 18 months ago, and I was looking at the, the, the latest report that came out then, that when there's more than one person on the thumbnail, there's an increase in the click-through rate. And when there is an expression of emotion, the greater the expression of the emotion, the more likely that that thumbnail was to get clicked on as well. What is it about people seeing emotion in others that makes them interested in? So it taps into the core of who we are. And because we can't control it really, it's somewhat of a magic. The, the, fact that the, the fact that you can make me feel something, you can get into my brain, bypass the filters I create and make me feel something, suggests that you in a way have an influence on my internal states. And this to our brain is an amazing thing. Like our brain is trying all the time to control itself. Our, our, our you know, fingers in the example before that are above everything, the neocortex, is trying its best to control the thoughts and memories that we have to make better decisions. The fact that someone else can do it to us and sometimes better than us is magic to our own brain. When we see a comedian and they make us laugh, this means that they knew what we're thinking, they knew what our internal thoughts would go to, and they managed to break that in our own mind, make us laugh. Like the laughter is, a, is, a, is basically, the, they don't say something like the, the, the comedian doesn't say, I don't know, all blondes are dumb. He just tells us something that makes us in our mind say, oh, it was because she was blonde. And we say, oh, it's embarrassing. Why did I say that? So I'm saying the thing that they didn't say, and I'm feeling embarrassed because a thought that came into my mind that they didn't say, but I had to think. And then the, Laughter is the explosion of this discomfort between a thought that came to my mind that would plant it by someone else that I had to think, but I'm not happy with. All of this is humor. And that is why we love comedian, why we uh, are 
in love with people who make us feel things. That, that's the, I'm, I'm really going on a, a philosophical thing, but to be in love is to let someone else control your own brain and have access to things that you don't have access in your own mind. That is remarkable. I'll, I'll say one more thing, and then I promise, I promise I, I, I'll stop with the philosophy. In a way, I think that our culture appreciates celebrities mm. because what they are is a thought in our mind that we know others share and we let in. So everyone sees Marlon Brando, knows who they are. We know that you know who it is. We know that in your brain you have a cell that codes Marlon Brando that is also in my brain. We all basically have a collective thought that we know we share uh, at the image of Marilyn Monroe, and it impresses us that someone was able to imprint a thought in so many brains as mind. And that is why we are so fascinated by people that are just known. Mm. And now, then I'm taking a break. No, no, I, we'll, take, we'll take a short break and we'll be right back. Um, <laughs> I, I will round it off with this. So like we're mammals, right? So we're a pack animal. We're socially orientated creatures. And, and as a result, you know, oftentimes as we learn, grow, adapt, evolve and develop, one of the ways that we learn is we look to the pack. We, we look to the herd in, in order to, in some cases, respond in situations where we're unsure of how to respond. And look, I think it's fair to say that marketers have known that social proof has been an incredibly powerful you know, form of influence for a very long time. And it lends to the celebrity factor as well, you know, when because celebrity is a, is a, is a, I guess you'd call it an authoritative form of social proof. You know, mm-hmm. and then we've got relative social proof. So authoritative social proof would be, well, I saw, you know, Michael Clark, the cricketer, use that 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 cricket bat. And so that's the cricket bat that I want to use because he's, you know, one of the greatest batsmen in the world. Uh, and then we've got relative social proof when it's when we can see people, oh, that guy's just like me. Oh, and he does that. Or maybe that's what I should do. And it's a it's a catch twenty two because if we grow up in an environment where we're being socially proofed by the wrong behaviors, we grow up and adapt to think that they're normal and the right and the correct behaviors, despite what evidence that might be contrary to you know what we're trying to do. So I guess from my perspective is, what is social proof, and how do we use it intelligently in a way to influence people to do the things that are better for them. And again, the, the 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 presupposition is here, if we're trying to influence someone, we're trying to influence them for the better, not for the worse. Okay, I wrote three things I won't forget. Uh, so in a way, uh, one of the reasons people are willing to pay a lot uh, to put an ad on Facebook compared to other medium is the understanding that if your friend tells you you should buy this thing versus if Samsung tells you you should buy this thing, you immediately have expectations that Samsung is trying to give you something that you might not need because their interest is for you to buy. But if your friend tells you that, their interest is your interest. So people are willing to pay a lot more for Facebook ads because if your friend tells you, I clicked it off, an influencer says, I'm using it, we like it. That is why influencing is so pop- popular because you kind of trust someone who is on you know, the same, in, in your bubble more than you trust someone that you deem a marketing person. So the idea of all marketing right now is somehow to penetrate your bubble and get someone in your sphere to tell you you should buy that. If I can make your best friend tell you those are the best headphones, buy them, then whoever sells the headphones did a good job because they managed to penetrate the world of marketing and get you to do something. So that is... And, and what's interesting, the data reflects that because what the data tells us is... Um, Clicks from shared content are five times more likely to re- re- result in a sale than clicks from a, sh- a piece of content that hasn't been shared by someone in the network. That's 500%. Exactly right. That's fucking powerful. Yeah. So so we get that. So, so now take it to the extreme. This means that the world of marketing is interested in creating bubbles and knowing who's in the bubble and controlling them. So everyone's interest right now is in having you talk to people like you or that can influence you or that share ideas with you and then for someone on the outside to know okay i can draw a circle around this group and find one person there and make him or her start kind of communicating my ideas so everything is about creating small clusters and understanding them now this was happening all the time anyhow tribes were formed countries were formed communication were formed but through the power of social media and through the power of technology this now is on steroids everyone is always part of some group 
Uh, Facebook clusters you, uh, Twitter clusters you, all companies segment you. You always, for everyone, part of a segment. The segments become smaller. It might be just you and two other people that are in this. But we know that if we make this person tell you that, you're going to be influenced. So the one advice I would have, control it yourself. Decide who you want to be influenced by. How do you do that? You look at the people around you and you say, who I consistently am aligned with. When they say something and I do that, I feel happy. When I say something, they listen. There are people like that in everyone's sphere. Choose them. Tell them, you and I are now part of this group that I'm going to use for this and that idea. And then spend more time physically with these people. Now, I know that right now is physically is a bit of a hard thing. But generally, what we know is that the brain uh, tunes quickly to interactions with people that it sits next to. So if you and I spend a lot of time talking to each other, we will start using the same words. We will nod our head roughly the same time. We would uh, use the same jargon to describe ideas uh, that only we know. We'll have internal jokes. We'll develop our own little tribe. So if you choose the people that you want to be like, you have more control over which ideas influence you, how much, and kind of how, how to stop them. And I think that's something that up to now happened to us. And I think that the world around us requires us to start choosing that. We have to choose who we want. So the, the, the parallel, the simple one is that you choose who to follow on Twitter or on Facebook. Mm. I think you should choose that in real life as well. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm seeing it fractionalize on social media because, you know, once upon a time in order to be influential on social media, you know, it was just having a big presence. But what we're now discovering is there's less activity on main feeds. There's more activity in groups, which in, it, which in itself is a form of, you know, selective segmentation um, at a community level. And we're seeing, and that's why obviously Facebook is pushing groups uh, as such a strong medium because they're seeing such a high level of engagement within groups versus people just engaging in general. I'll give you Moran, science. This, can I, can I drop science for yes. like a, a Talk minute? Guys. Let's get nerdy. I, I think, I think it, it would be useful if I, if I uh, sound like a scientist at the end. So I'll say that. <laughs> uh, um, we have studies that uh, look at a specific problem in marketing that uh, is uh, interesting to a lot of your customers. That's, it's called in marketing the cold start problem. And it goes like that. If you've been a user of uh, Facebook for the last year, Facebook knows a lot about you. So if you stop using it for a while, Facebook can say, OK, something is not right with him. Let's uh, blast him with some promotion so he would use it more. Or uh, maybe he's about to leave us. So let's kind of see if we can give him more exciting things in the feed. If they have enough data about you, they can do things when things change with you. But what happens on day one? You just joined Facebook on day one. We know nothing about you. What can we do then? So it turns out, and this is the research that we've been doing in the last couple of uh, years, if I know nothing about you, if you just joined an app today, you joined a service today, but I know something about your friends, we can actually predict a lot about your behavior mm. on the platform one month, two months, six months in the future just by seeing how they act on that. Mm. This means that companies right now should not only collect data about their users when they use the app and kind of try to infer who they are, but also try as best as they can to know something about your social network. As soon as you join and look at your triangle, we call that the three people that you talk to and whether they talk to themselves, average those and make predictions about you. And the science shows that you are extremely accurately predictable. Uh, if I look at the average of people on the platform that you just joined that were there before you for a few weeks. Science. I love it. Moran, Dr. Moran, I should say. That's a very nice title. I should say I've always wanted one of those. Mate, Dr. Uh, Surf. Dr. That's really Surf. really good one. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Surf, mate, honestly, it's like you, you need a, a Malibu board and a, and, and a tan right now and a, and a few bleach tips and you'll be uh, Dr. Surf all day long. Moran, mate, thank you so much for your time. You have delivered an incredible wealth of knowledge. If people want to find out more about you or more about – because you've written a, a bunch of – a bunch of articles you've written a bunch of books as well what have you written where where yeah, are they so much i'm too uh, too out there i need to tame down a little bit my thing if they just look my look up my name moran surf you will find tons of things about me uh, and i'm 
I think in the context of that, what I, what I want is for people to actually engage with the content. So I promise to your audience that if they look me up and have questions and so on, if they email, if they ask, I'm answering. I'm a scientist, but I find this really important. So I'm there. You're a bloody legend, mate. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Moran Surf, also known as Dr. Surf, hanging 10 on Unstoppable. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much, Karin. Legend, mate. This episode was brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for business. There you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And please do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you get to see all of these interviews in the flesh. Share this podcast with your friends and drop me a review on iTunes. I would love to hear what you guys think and also let you know that your comments help make sure that we keep producing killer content just like this. And if you'd like to stay up to date with all of my movements, upcoming podcasts, events, and much more, please jump onto the website, KerwinRay.com, and also check us out on all social media on the handle at Kerwin Ray. Thanks for joining us.